take it by Benning. Darnell Nurse left it in the corner, gets up center. Perry scoops. Corey Perry. Lillian able to shake away from Solani. It's given away to Solani around the front. Score! Tamu Solani with the steal. Perry in the face, one block. Hey everybody, welcome to the Forever Mighty Podcast. It's been a long time since I've said that. It feels good to be back. It's the uh, 2020 NHL Draft Review with Steven and Eddie and I. And wow, I think it's uh, it's about time that uh, we had a couple of shows in one week. What do you think? Yeah, really? Eddie? <laughs> it's, been, <laughs> it's been a while since we've been able to do <laughs> one show. It's been, it's been like one show a month, which I'm surprised we've been able to get out, but... Uh, the Ducks have done, well, no, I guess not just the Ducks. The NHL has done us a favor with piling the draft and free agency right on top of each other. The Ducks are actually making moves, and obviously we have uh, the draft to recap. Yeah, so I don't know what, I don't know. I don't know what happened yesterday. I know the first <laughs> day was really fun. The second day wasn't so fun. I don't know about you guys, but I remember sitting here, I'm trying to work, and I keep seeing I, I, the Twitter notifications going and going, and I, it's like, has the draft been going on for 12 hours? Because I feel like it started like at 8 o'clock with draft coverage and then it just never ended. When did it finally wrap yesterday? Oh, man. Uh, 7.30 p.m. my time, so 4.30 p.m. your time. It, it was uh, – it bordered on eight hours. It was about uh, so seven rough. hours and 53 minutes or something. <laughs> like – I get it, man. Like the, it's virtual. These guys have all the time in the world. Nobody has to catch a flight out of Montreal. You know, the, there's no reason to rush the draft. But holy man, like, uh, felt you know, me and Stephen both write for the hockey writers, and Anthony uh, Cherdelli, who also writes for the hockey writers, put in our Slack chat that day about the Red Wings. It seemed like every time they came up to the podium, they just re- let the clock run out. <laughs> they just took it's the like full three or three four minutes. minutes, right? Yeah, and then there was trades and stuff, which. The clock always runs out on trades, so like you'd have to wait three minutes for that pick. Then you'd have to wait another three minutes for that the team that just got the pick traded for them to make the pick. And yeah, like the the full second round was as long as the first round, which I don't think I've ever seen happen. Yeah, the second round was insane. Like it it felt like it was getting longer, which like I don't know. I feel like the farther you get into the draft, like you you've got like three or four names at every spot. It's like, okay, if this guy's here, great, that's him. If not, we're going to get this guy. It's like, there's like 400 kids or whatever in the draft, and like, come on, you guys can't all have the same three kids. <laughs> they barely <laughs> did. <laughs> it lasted forever. I, uh, I, the, the, the baffling part um, to me was it felt like a setup on the first day. I know Eddie and I were chatting about it all throughout the, the first day of the draft. It felt like a setup. Every time that they were ready to announce they would like pan to the kid sitting in um in in his living room ready ready to the to kid be told who is be about to get picked too about to get picked like they knew they knew it and then i talked to jimmy about it um and he was telling me that no they had hats and jerseys for these kids at a ton of them he's like That's drysdale I... probably has like 28 jerseys that you know that he was going to be able to have in case he got picked that's it wasn't guessed. a setup, apparently. I guess that because I th- who was it? Um, third round pick, I think Justin Sourdiff for Florida. His dad like chucked him a the Panthers jersey and he dropped it, but it was in like a, a like a package, like it was wrapped up in plastic. So like uh, maybe the NHL actually did send these guys like thirty jerseys each, but like at the Sabers pick at eight. They went off the board. They took Jack Quinn. That's an off the board pick because guys like Marco Rossi were still there. The whole intro before they picked Jack Quinn, the NHL Network was showing Jack Quinn's house. Like, come on! I, I I felt like at least at least day one, day two wasn't staged because it was like eight hours. Day one felt like they drafted an hour beforehand and then used the footage to go and do it again. Well, it's like they know. had to have some sort of level of security in case Zoom failed. Like, they wanted to make sure the, the kid already knew who he was getting put to, right? Yeah. Were there any major trades day one? There was the, the Flames traded down twice with picks, but that was oh, it. That's right. They went from, what, 19 to 22 and then 22 to 24? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which, I, I, like, I... I 
my I don't think it was staged, but like just the beginning part of the draft was so weird because they were literally like and it must have been coincidence, but they were literally showing all like at Ottawa's pick. They were showing Drysdale and Sanderson, and then Sanderson gets picked. And then at Anaheim's pick, they only showed Drysdale, and Drysdale goes, and then Quinn goes when they're only showing Quinn. And, yeah, it was it was weird. Yeah, once you pointed that out, it I saw into the chat, and I was just kind of like, this does feel staged. Because normally, like, you would think they would put up, you know, at least two or three screens to show a couple of the kids that are in contention. And it was just one kid the entire time. And then, you know, there's, I guess the one thing you would say is the fact that there was like a 45 second delay for each kid finding out is yeah. maybe the one thing that, you know, it wasn't a setup, but going backwards, it definitely did kind of feel like it might've been a setup. <laughs> it, yeah, it, it felt weird for sure. Uh, you, know you know what? Let's all agree that the best thing about that day, other than dry still getting picked was Alex Trebek doing the pick for the Sens at number three. <laughs> Apparently, he had to record three different videos for Lafreniere, Byfield, and Stutzel just in case they got somebody else at three. Uh, but that yeah, that was that was my favorite. That was the best way you could ever have a draft pick, uh, like a virtual draft pick, to make the kid kind of remember that moment. Other than um, San Jose at 31, um, they drafted Ozzy Weisblatt and his mom's deaf and whoever they had on there, he signed, uh, they yeah. signed his name when they picked him, which is pretty cool. They, uh, I think one of the best tweets I saw from those people waiting to hear, I think it was, um, it was Jack Quinn, right? He was sitting there and Sean McIndoe from Puck Soup tweeted something pretty funny. He wrote, uh, was kind of hoping that long shot of Quinn's family sitting in silence would just continue until somebody off screen screen was like, you got drafted by the Sabres, and they were like, oh, no, we know. We heard. <laughs> <laughs> like, not even stoked. Just like, shit, yeah. now I'm going to be here. Great. Wonderful. <laughs> Every year, that's what they say for the Sabres and the Oilers picks, because of when Connor McDavid found out the Oilers won the draft lottery, he didn't, mm-hmm. didn't look too happy. So, Well, let's, let's talk about the Ducks for a minute here. I mean, that's what we're here to do anyway. But very interesting that that article came out saying that they were just dead set on getting a defenseman. So we knew right away it was either Sanderson or Drysdale. But that that to me is baffling because my like myself and many other Ducks fans, I don't know if Steven if you had heard last year Bob Murray had his hot stove where they do like the the year in review and they talk about the future of the club after the season. You know, he talked about um, they need a scoring winger and he's like, I know Madden likes his likes his defenseman. We develop defensemen well and you know, he's really good at getting him because I want a scoring winger. I really want a scoring winger. So everyone there was excited. Yeah, we agree. We, you know, Corey Perry's not here anymore to bury the puck. Yeah, Zagra's coming up. Getzloff's going to be falling back. Where's the scoring winger? So everyone, I mean, we've been talking about it for months. Holtz is going to go. That's what we were thinking. And sure as shit, they pick a defenseman. <laughs> just, <laughs> it's out of nowhere. I, I just was found that very strange to me that they were just dead set on that. What about you guys? I think, and... I'm going to kind of I'll play my hand a little bit. I'm going to write something about this kind of for hockey writers. But I think to me, the main takeaway there is that Bob Murray doesn't expect to have a top pick next year. Because I think, you know, me and uh, Eddie talked about this last time that, you, you know, next year is uh, defenseman heavy. So if you feel that you're going to have a good pick and you're going to be able to take a good defenseman, then why wouldn't you take one of the handful of forwards that are there that can really create offense, which is what this team's been, you know, in dire need of for four or five years now. Um, But they went and they said, these are the two best defensemen in this draft and we're going to get one of them. To me, that meant that they had, you know, and then they take Perot and Colangelo at the, with the, what do you call it? 27 and 36 pick. And I think that to me really cements, it's like, we know we need to get goal scorers. So we're going to get these two guys who have the upside. But the thing that we don't have is a high-end defenseman. And if we get that guy now, we think one of these two guys can step into the lineup sooner than later. And, you know, I, I think he expects to be at least in the wild card conversation next season. I don't know how realistic that is. But, you know, and then he took all those defensemen on the back end of the draft. Uh, to me, that's just this draft is to address needs that they may not get the chance to next year. Yeah. Well, they certainly are missing that power play quarterback. Go ahead, Ed. Sorry. Well, no, they're, they're missing a lot of things, right? So, 
you know, it, it's not a stretch for them to take a defensive. Now, you know, the, the real concerning part about that whole kind of quote that uh, Martin Madden and, and Murray had, and I think it was Eric Stevens' article that came out. I'll, I'll read the quote, quote in a minute here. But, you know, the concerning thing is that if, if the Ottawa didn't take Sanderson, if they took Drysdale, <laughs> we'd be sitting here today talking about Jake Sanderson being an Anaheim Duck. And I, I know Sanderson's stock rose after league shut down and people were able to watch more film of him and and he's a great player the problem is like he you know drysdale's the type of player we need if you need a defenseman we've been saying that for how many years the ducks need a puck moving defenseman whether he's right shot or left shot you know it doesn't really matter obviously having a right shot puck moving defenseman is, is nice and it's ideal but you know they were that close to taking sanderson because they had them according to bob murray and martin madden side by side on their board i don't know who was ahead of who but it doesn't really matter because the sens looked like they were taking a defenseman at five so we were we were pretty lucky that the sens took sanderson because you know he could be a duck today and and, and essentially you know cam fowler 2.0 the 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 kind of book on sanderson is he's a great defenseman he's got the quickness he's got the speed he can transition up the the ice well but the offensive side of his game is the biggest question mark. It sounds a lot. So like uh, what you're what you're saying is like he's just missing that that term dynamic. When you look at Drysdale skating, you see dynamic skating uh, and playmaking ability too. Like the clip you saw me today of him being able to pivot his hips and skate backwards in the offensive zone and feed out in front of the net. Sure, that's not NHL level, but when a guy's already thinking like that and can move like that, that's to me says a lot about an upside that the Ducks are missing for sure. Um, and like I know some people were asking me about this too. Is you know, do you really are you really that down on Drysdale instead of a winger? I'm like, no, he's a great player. I just I just really felt the Ducks would have better fit to fill a need on wing at this time around. It's just this draft, right? Like this draft, the four depth at that position was so good. Yeah, I know Raymond went four and, and it wasn't the Red Wings really shocking people by taking Raymond because I think he deserved to go there. It was that there was rumors they were gonna take Askarov or Perfetti or somebody else. Um but, you know, at six you know, the pick for me would have been Alexander Holtz. I And not, you know, out of a pure need, for sure, he's the best pure goal scorer in the draft. And, yes, the Ducks probably got the second best shooter in Jacob Perot at, at 27, and I didn't expect Perot to be there at 27. But I just think when we look down the road, or at least projecting right now, I think Jamie Drysdale is going to be an NHL defenseman. You know, at the very least, he's going to be a top four defenseman. But in terms of being a legitimate number two, a number one or a number two, I'm not sure. But with Alexander Holtz, I know he's going to be a first line uh, right wing scorer in this league. Like he just has all you know the the intangibles and the makings to be that. You can see that already. And you know you're taking a bit of a, a gamble on Jamie Drysdale. And like Stephen said, with the draft being so strong a defenseman next year, you know I think Ducks fans for a while have kind of been at a different point with the projecting this team. You know, I think we all, or at least a lot of us think that they're not going to be that great next year, even if they go out and add some players in free agency and, and Trevor Zegras has a good year. You know, Bob Murray's been kind of, he's stuck to his guns over the last couple of years where he thinks this is a better team than they are. And, and you kind of see that with the Drysdale pick where, you know, they're hoping to get Drysdale in there in a couple of years and, and they'll add some scoring in, in different places. Yeah. So, oh, come on. No, go, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, I, the only thing that I wanted to say, and I think is at least provides some positivity to the Drysdale pick, right, is, you know, it's kind of become, because skating and speed has become such an important part of the league, like the term puck moving defenseman has kind of been bastardized into meaning an offensive defenseman, which isn't the same thing. Cam Fowler is a puck-moving defenseman. Lindholm is a puck-moving defenseman, right? They can skate, they can carry the puck, they can do a good job. The thing that Drysdale has is he has that 50-point potential, which the Ducks haven't had anybody like that in a while. You know, there may have been some hope that Cam Fowler would have been that guy. He wasn't. There had maybe been some hope that Brandon Montour could have been 80 85% of that guy. He wasn't. Um, so I, I do like that they took a smaller guy and so far as they must love that skill and skating that's there if they're fine taking a guy who's 5'11". And I just, I think the upside is there to make the pick worth it, but I do think it's hard to look at the forwards on the team and the forwards in the pipeline and not go, there's nobody here I trust to score 30 goals. 
Mm-hmm. And at some point, that needs to be the priority. No, so what, how do you guys feel about uh, Jaco Parole? Uh, it was the Ducks' 27th, or 27th overall pick, their second pick of the draft. He's supposed to be that guy. Uh, Corey Promise says he's, he's going to be a top six winger in this league if he's able to hit his potential. So it's kind of going along with what you guys are saying, right? They, they really needed a, a, a defenseman. We all know that. Um, and then they're like, hey, we got to get forwards. So I don't know a whole lot about him. How do you guys feel about, about his style and what he, what he brings? Is he going to be able to be that person that's going to be able to fill a need if he's able to hit that? Is he that good? Because you got to explain to guys like me who just don't know. I don't, pay, I don't, I don't know a lot of prospects besides the top guys. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I think if if you were going into this draft and you wanted Alexander Holtz, I think the next best option is Jack and Perot in terms of a pure goal scorer, a great shot, exceptional release. Like he is the guy you would have wanted besides Alexander Holtz. You know, he he can score from anywhere in the ice. He's one of the very few prospects I've ever heard that has consistently worked on their backhand. Like he does that all the time. He's got an exceptional back end, which again, like the really only prospect that, and I'm not making comparisons here. The last prospect that I've heard that like routinely works on their back end is Sidney Crosby. And obviously you can see that he has one of the best back ends in the NHL. But I, I think with Perot is, you know, the, the ducks are getting a player who could be a potential 30 goal scorer with a player like Trevor Zegras. I think they see the fit there. Now, you know, Perot isn't going to drive a line by himself, but he is a very quick player. He has a second gear where he can, he can get up to and beat players with speed. He's got good hands and, and skill to beat players in tight. And then he's got that exceptional shot on, on either the forehand or the backhand where he can beat goalies in a variety of ways. So he's going to be a I don't want to say guaranteed 20 goal score at the NHL, but if things go well, he will be a consistent 20 goal score and potentially scraping the surface on 30 goals. But, you know, the reason he fell, you know, I know we're hyping him up talking about how he's the second best goal scorer in the draft. The reason he fell to 27, obviously, is because there are some concerns among the scouting community and uh, in different front offices in the NHL with his defensive side of the game and his consistency. So he's he can kind of be a little bit lazy on plays, which, you know, it's concerning when you do it all the time. But there are plays where, you know, when when his team's in the game and it's a close game, like he will come back and he will, you know, back check and he'll, you know, pressure on the floor check and he'll he'll use he's not a big guy, but he'll you know play physical and use the body. But there are times where, you know, if his team's down, Sarnia was not a great team last year, you'd catch a, you know, start engaging defensively and then kind of just drift off. And, and skate and watch the play and it's a bit concerning um you know not as much because like, he played on a bad team and you know he could just be one of those players where you know you're the best player in your team you know you bet you're the best player in your team and you're just kind of disengaged because you're really trying to do everything and and you, you can't and you know it, I, I, I hate that kinda, let him be yeah. one-dimensional let him be one-dimensional if he scores right. goals who cares like i just don't care about a winger playing all that much d like if they're gonna knock him on that i'll take him all day if he puts in 25 30 goals a year i don't care so I think that's the interesting thing, right? It's because, you know, and Eddie, you're better at this than me, so correct me if I'm wrong, but, like, to my knowledge, like, Jack Quinn is the second goal scorer that came off the board as far as what you're projecting guys to be. And the thing about Jack Quinn is, you know, you hear he doesn't have maybe necessarily the high high total offside as far as 35, 40 goals like Holtz, but he plays 200 feet. He's good at getting into spaces. He goes to the greasy areas. He does all those things that you can reasonably project will mean he's getting himself into good opportunities and his brain makes up for what may not be the best shot in the world. And then he's just kind of got a knack at finishing, you know, and I think Perot, the consistency of thing to me, like I'm he, what is he? 17, 18. Like, I'm not that worried about it. Yeah. The interesting thing for me is, is like, Akins in that way would be a great coach for a guy like that, but I have no idea what Pro's timeline is. I don't know that Akins is going to be the coach by the time he's a rookie. So I think that's a little bit interesting as far as because I, I do think Akins is a good coach as far as or he has the potential at least to be a good coach as far as motivating guys and getting them to play up because you know the things that you hear about him coming out of the team or that he's good at communicating with guys, they get the impression that he, that he cares. And they want to play for him. And I, I think the thing about Perot that I like 
is that he's not someone where when you say 40 points, you're like 2020 kind of like a, a Troy Terry is. He's like, he can get 25, maybe 30 goals, maybe more if he develops a little bit better than we're expecting. And, and he, he can skate. Just like you said, like if his shot is good enough that he's got a top five shot and he fell to 27 because he doesn't skate hard enough backwards or, you know, back check, I, I'm not going to be that worried about that. That's, okay. you know, when he, that's, that's professionalism. You can teach guys how to be a professional and you can put them in positions to succeed and make up for that. So then how did you guys feel about the, the 36th overall pick, Sam Colangelo? I know he's a big kid. He likes to hit. That's what I heard them say a lot when they talked about him. And they also said he's got he's got a knack for the net too, which I know is, a, is a, obviously a good thing you want to have in a player. But uh, I, I don't know. I feel like he's like a power forward type. When I when I saw some of his plays and, and the fact that uh, the Ducks picked him didn't surprise me at all. Yeah, I think the thing that was most interesting about Colangelo is you know, he led the uh, USHL in points per game, but he only had like 12, I think, or 20, something like that. Like a real low number, all things considered, uh, power play points. He didn't get a lot of power play time. He was doing his stuff five on five, you know, and I think that's really promising. You know, maybe you could say it's a little concerning that if he was that good on offense, but he's not on the power play, what's the issue? Excuse me. But I think, you know, if he's producing at five on five at a rate like that and he's able to use that body and get into those kind of areas like eddie correct me if i'm wrong but the one big issue with him seems to just be is his skating going to be good enough when did we lose ed i don't know i think you ran away uh, <laughs> you lost me for a sec i don't know what happened <laughs> oh we're down <laughs> yeah i uh i lost my uh my audio i hope everybody in the chat can still hear me um all right sorry what were what were, <laughs> i like literally <laughs> i i, I lost the, the audio for skype i don't know what happened like everything all the rest of my audio for, was fine and i lost the audio for skype so i didn't hear anything you guys said i hope you were saying good words about about jacob perot um, oh we, you missed all of that okay yeah we did we did say good words about him now we're uh, we were talking about sam colangelo and i was saying you know for a kid he's Let's, he's a big kid. He's six foot two, over two hundred pounds. He's got a nasty edge, but he can also shoot the puck. And and um, Stephen was asking you your opinion about him about his skating, and maybe that's maybe that's a concern. Yeah, yeah. So I'll get back to to Perot after this because I did want to say something. But yeah, Colangelo is he reminds me a bit of Max Jones in terms of a, you know, a bigger forward. Skating's kind of an issue. Like he doesn't have the prettiest skating stride. Like he's not a, a Jamie Drysdale. He's a bit choppy. But he, he, you know, he's got average NHL skating. Like he's got average speed. He's not gonna, you know, wow anybody. But he's not gonna, you know, get, he's not slow by any means. Uh, but he's got, you know, a, a lethal goal scoring touch in, you know, dirty areas if you want to call them that. You know, he can get it done in front of the net. He's got a good enough shot that he can score from different areas. Um, but he, he's just like one of those guys you just want on your team. You know, you look at teams like Toronto right now who are trying to find players like this guys who kind of play with an edge and, and can kind of do everything and can still put the puck in the back of the net. And I feel like the ducks have two of those guys now. Like I could honestly see Max Jones and Sam Colangelo playing on a line and being one of those lines you throw out there is kind of an energy line, but they can score and you put a, a decent two way center with some playmaking ability between them, like a guy like Sam Steele and, Right there, you've got you know a, a line that I don't want to call it a shutdown line because I don't really think it is, but it, it's an energy line. You know, you've got three guys who aren't afraid to engage physically. You got some big boys on the wings, and it's it's a line you kind of grind away at a team with, especially in a playoff series. And, and you know, I know Colangelo's kind of got a long way to go. He's going to go to college eventually, and, and you know, he's a bit of a project. But I like when you have three picks in the top thirty-six or top forty. I like one of those to be this type of pick, a guy you can work on a project. He's got the raw size, the raw shooting ability, and then you just kind of work on the minor points of his game. You know, you, you, you help him kind of change up his skating stride. You, you help him work on the defensive side of the game, and he becomes one of those valuable middle six wingers that, uh, you know, that teams covet down the road. And you look at what, um, look at what uh, Tampa Bay gave up for players like Blake Coleman and Barkley Goodrow, right? Right. So that's that's what I was going to ask you is if we're sitting here in five years 
and we're looking at a line of uh, Steele, Jones, and Colangelo, and they're kind of that perfect high end third, maybe middle at low end two like line. Like that's a good spot to be in, right? You're looking at a line like you said. You got two wingers who can play the body, who can get in on the forecheck. You've got Sam Steele who makes smart plays. Uh, you can pick a pass, things like that. Like that, that feels like you can talk yourself into a situation where that works out for everybody. Yeah, yeah, and and I think when you know we were talking about Perot before before we had some more technical diff- difficulties with the show, I think he's a perfect guy to pair with Trevor Segrist. Now, obviously, Alexander Holtz was the ideal candidate. I know we were talking a bit about Jack Quinn uh, as well, and and I think you know with Perot, you know, we were talking about issues with his consistency in the defensive side of the game. And, and Pat, I think you kind of nailed it on the head is, you know, let him be one dimensional if he wants to be one di- one dimensional. The, the thing I, about Perot is I, I don't think he's a one dimensional player. I just think, you know, he's just doesn't like the situation he's in. And obviously, I, you know, I don't know the full details of it, but I know Sarn just not a great team. And he just looks disengaged in games where they the games that don't mean anything. Games... But he still scored sixty nine goals in his first two seasons. Yeah, not, he scored thirty goals as a, as a sixteen year old rookie, and then thirty nine last year. Like he he's as pure a goal scorer as they come, and you know he's got speed when he wants to use it. Like this is the thing about Perot is you know there are players out there who you know they just don't have the speed and it's never there, or the defensive side of the game is never there. But Perot has it every now and then. So you know he can do it. It's just about consistency and, and doing it more often. And you can coach that. Like, I'm not worried about that. You put him in the right system or, you you know, maybe it's just jumping up to the NHL and, and playing at that level and that, you know, that's the switch for him. Or, or maybe you kind of have to coach that into him over, you know, the course of his first two seasons. But eventually he'll get there and he'll be more of a complete player. He'll be a competent, a, a, you know, defensive player in the NHL. And... You know, going along with the goal scoring ability in the hands, he's a capable playmaker as well. And you know, we all for, we all talk about Zegers's playmaking ability, but we forget that Zegers can still shoot the puck too. And I think both of these guys are going to be able to play off of each other, and it's going to fool a lot of teams. Like who's going to pass? Who's going to shoot? We we know Perot's probably the shooter, but you know, both of them are creative creative enough that you know down the road they're they're going to be a fun duo to watch. You know, it, we we were blessed back in the day with with Korea and Solani, and and obviously I'm not saying Zegris and Pro are going to get to that level, but th- they have that kind of all round. I heard it. <laughs> they, they just have that all around ability, right? Where they they can all kind of do everything that they can get to that. I think the big thing for the Ducks too is is Pro's a right hand shot. And that power play is going to do wonders for him. He, he's not a guy who needs the power play to score a lot of goals, but you put him in the Ovechkin no, spot. No, the Ducks need the power play. <laughs> yeah, you put him in the Ovechkin spot, and he's going to beat goalies all day from that angle. Or he'll go behind the net or in front of the net or the opposite side. Like, the good thing about Perot is you can put him anywhere, and he'll beat a goalie from any side. So the Ducks took uh, number 67, Ian Moore, big defenseman. Um, word on him is he's, he's quick, but... Uh, it said he was just having a little bit of issue with, with decision-making and all, so he's kind of one of those guys, I guess, that's going to take some development here. He's more probably like a, a depth defenseman, it looks like the Ducks took, but uh, that's just my amateur takeaway from that. What about uh, what about you guys? Steven, what do you think about Ian Moore? You know, uh, I have to admit, I haven't necessarily watched a lot of uh, Boston high school hockey. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> haven't we all? <laughs> I, well, I figured Eddie would have the lowdown, so I was wanting to get your, your opinion out of the way first. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, you know, I think, like I, like you said, you know, some of the things is his strength seems to be a little, like offensive instincts and skating. Like, I feel like three or four years ago, you know, I mean, oh, you can even look at last year. Like, it's a joke with Eddie. Like, I know he knows, like, in the Slack. But, like, I love Hunter Drew because he's a, you know, a 1990s kind of defenseman where he's just mean. Like, that's just what he does. He's just mean and he punches people and it's great. And I love it because I'm, you know. That's the kind of hockey I like. But, like, the fact that they were like, this guy's going to need some coaching on on defense, but we think he can use his skating and use those instincts to create going forward. Like, you know, I think while maybe some of these picks, you know, it's you wonder about the upside and things like that, but I think what they signify as far as the direction the organization is moving in, I think is very promising. And I think a guy like Ian Moore really highlights that. Because I don't know that Bob Murray makes this pick four years ago. 
I can tell you exactly why they made this pick. And it's, I don't normally like the high school kids getting picked. I didn't like Jackson Lacombe last year. The high school league, I know the U.S. high school circuit is way different than Canadian high school circuit. Canadian high school hockey really doesn't exist at a competitive level. So I know, especially in, in you know, New England and the Boston area and uh, in Minnesota, like high school hockey is huge. So I get, it. you know, he got a call up at one point to the national de- uh, development team in the U.S. as well. So it is you know, kind of a stepping stone for those players. But they're, they're usually pretty raw at this level. But the reason I think the Ducks took Ian Moore here is apparently he's best friends with Henry Thrun. And the, not only that, Ian Moore, as you talked about, slick skating defenseman, you know, an offensive defenseman, a guy you groom as a power play quarterback. But you know who's the perfect type of player to pair him with? A stay-at-home, reliable, two-way defenseman. And he happens to be best friends with one, and one that's coming up in the Ducks organization. So maybe they're grooming a future pairing of, of Henry Thrun and Ian Moore. Uh, I like this pick more than Jackson Lacombe last year because I think it, it kind of fills a secondary need behind Drysdale. Like, you don't want Drysdale to be your only puck moving offensive defenseman. That's a lot of pressure to put on a guy. You want a secondary option. And who knows, in the future, you know, if Ian Moore, he's a project for sure, as is any high school player. I mean, look at Casey Middlestat in, in Buffalo. I'm sure they regret drafting him out of high school as high as they did. So he's definitely a project. But you know, eventually he'll go to college. We'll see what he can do there. But if he even just scratches the surface of his potential, you know, you've got a future one, two of Lindholm, Drysdale, and, and Thrun, and, and Ian Moore. And you've got, you know, two right handed offensive defensemen who can skate and move the puck. And you've got two reliable two-way defensemen who are also capable of, of you know, their modern-day two-way defensemen. And they can skate, get the puck up the ice, and, and they keep the game simple. And, you know, the difference between Ian Moore and, and a guy like Jamie Drysdale is Ian Moore is 6'2". You know, he's 6'2", 171 pounds, so he's fairly lanky. But, you know, playing weight, he's probably going to get to 195, 200 at least. And, and that's going to come with time. When he puts on that size, I think he's going to kind of round out the rest of his game. The only question mark comes is, you know, once he puts on those 20 pounds, is he going to be as effective as a skater and, and a playmaker and whatever? That's a lot of playing weight to add on, and, and it kind of changes the, the, you know, the style of his game. But I like the pick. I like the swing in the third round. The Ducks aren't notorious for doing that other than kind of the last couple of drafts, so it is kind of a nice project to work on. And obviously there was a focus on right-handed defensemen in this draft, so... Steven's laughing over here. I'm one <laughs> kind of cut up a little bit and it Pat's face made me laugh. Oh, the audio was like, <laughs> I, all right, I get it. We're, we're using, okay. We're on, we're on the old system today. If you haven't realized by the setup, because the new system is having problems and obviously the old system doesn't work that great. So. Yeah, we're like, uh, we're like the millennium Falcon doesn't always work right. But when it does, it's awesome. That's, uh, that's the way it goes. <laughs> So, Eddie, I'm going to let you take these last four draft picks and go through them. This is definitely not my, my forte here, rounding out the last four guys of the draft. So, take yeah. it away, my friend. We'll go through these guys fairly quickly. Um, you know, obviously, like I mentioned before, the Ducks had a focus in this draft, and it was adding right-handed defensemen, which I think was probably the, the most important area that they added to. And, you know, they went out and, and got three of them in, in Drysdale, Moore, and uh, Timo Nickel at 104. And uh, Nickel's a bit of a blend of what we got from Moore in being kind of a pure offensive defenseman and Drysdale and being a bit more of, you know, obviously Drysdale's an elite offensive defenseman, but he's two-way focused as well. Nichols kind of right in that. And meanwhile, while Moore and, and Drysdale are kind of passers and, and skaters, Nickel is a bit more of a shooter. He's got a, a great shot on him. He was, uh, uh, you know, a master on the power play for Drummondville in the QMJHL. So it's a a bit of a throwback for, for the Ducks to bring him in. And he's got some size to him. Uh, he's he's Austrian, which you don't really see too many of them get drafted. So, uh, you know, nice for him and Marco Rossi in this draft. But, you know, he, he's got a long way to go. He's a, a import into the QMJHL and had an impressive first season. But he just kind of rounds out what the Ducks don't really have in their prospect pool. You know, I think there were better players on the board at 104, but when you look at a pure need for the Ducks, you know, Bob Murray said they don't have many shooters, especially up front or, or guys who go one time the puck on the power play. 
And, you know, Nickel's going to have a long way to go to be a solid top four defenseman or even a guy who's going to get on the power play at the NHL level. But I think at a, you know, a very low floor for him in a, in a place where, you know, it'd, it'd be good for the Ducks if he ended up is, you know, a, a five or six defenseman who you can throw on a second power play unit and has a decent, uh, decent enough shot to kind of contribute and, and put a, a few goals into the back of the net. So he, he's, you know, as any fourth round pick is, he's a bit of a, a project and it's going to take a while for him to get to the NHL level. But, you know, I like the, the focus on adding organizational depth at, at this point for him. Um, 129, I think is the big one for me because it's the first I love how time. That's a big one for you. It, only because nobody thought this was ever going to happen again. The Ducks drafted a Russian. Not only that, they drafted a, a four-time quadruple um, overager, a guy who's 21. You don't see that too often either, where a guy gets undrafted for three years and, and manages to get in on his last year of eligibility. Is this the first Russian since like Stanislav Chistov back in like 2000, well, yeah. 2000 or 2003 or whatever? Yeah, it's the first Russian skater since Chistov. Uh, the last Russian they drafted was Igor Bobkov in 2009. He's a goaltender. So Goaltender, yep. So it's been 2009 since any Russian has been picked, so 11 years and uh, almost 20 years since the last Russian skater the Ducks have picked, which is ridiculous. Like It's actually unbelievable that they've gone that long without drafting Russians. Uh, and then they go way off the board, and, and they draft. They don't even draft a guy who's in his first year of eligibility. They draft a guy who's in his last year of eligibility. And very interesting. And, and honestly, this is this pick does not get made if the draft is in June, because he was KHL Rookie of the Year last year, and to the start this year, he had like seven points in twelve games, and he was leading his team in scoring, playing first line minutes, playing first line power play. That made a huge difference, I think, in his draft stock this year, just like a lot of players did. I mean, you look at Columbus at number 21. They took Igor Chinikov, who by some scouts wasn't even ranked in the top seven rounds of their, their mock drafts or their rankings. Like, it all had to do with his start in the KHL this season and how he's being used. And, you know, I think Galimov is a nice kind of shift of change for the Ducks in terms of their picks. He's 21. He's got a couple more years left on his KHL contract. But he's a guy you could project being in the NHL roster immediately whenever he comes over. Like, at the, by the time he comes over, he'll be 22, 23, 24. And he can jump right into your middle six and be an effective player. And I think that's what the Ducks are kind of looking for at this point it is a guy who, you know, there's an easier way to kind of look at how he gets to the NHL. You know, for Nickel and Moore, it's a bit of a project. You have to kind of work with them and, and train them and build them up, and it's going to take some time, and maybe it doesn't pan out. With Galimov, he's already 21. He's playing against men. You know he can get it done. You know, Maybe the, the only risk is does it translate over to the NHL, but it, it's it's a nice pick. You know, that's why teams pick over agers because they can get to the NHL sooner rather than later. And I'm sure that's why the Ducks went for for Galimov on this one. I'd be interested. I know you guys don't know a ton about him, but I'd just be interested to hear your thoughts on on taking kind of a guy who's this old and and, and the first Russian in in so long. I have no idea why they would do that um, unless they're just trying to fill a gap in, in San Diego. I find it very strange to bring a guy in at like you said four he's a quadruple overager and he's russian and he has a contract in the khl so very curious as to why that happened i, I wish i could have put a question in for the hot stove event on saturday for that yeah it it kind of feels just like uh you know throwing the ball backwards over your head to see if you make it in the basket like it <laughs> and i don't think that's a terrible idea you know what i mean like at a certain point, the likelihood that any of these guys taken after maybe the second or you know after the second or third round are going to be quality NHLers drops drastically. So if you see a guy who maybe you think has a skill set that you can project into possibly making him an impact player, that's great. I mean, take the shot. I don't care. Like it's a fourth round pick. Like I don't want. I don't want. You know. Like uh, I think like Derek Grant. I was looking at this. Is like the fourth round pick who's played you know, the most games in the last in like five or six years or something like that. You know what I mean? Like these, these aren't guys where, you know, you know, Oh, Joe Pavelski is a seventh and Pavel Dotsuk is a, you know, 40th round pick or whatever. It's like, okay, fine. But those guys are really rare. Yeah. If you see somebody with a skill set that you think is, can benefit you and bring something to the team, I think that's great. I think the fact that he's a little skinny 
and I'm not, you know, he's not a big kid, I think is good. You know, like I said, I think we have seen this organization make mistakes historically focusing on size. And I think the fact that they're willing to get some of these guys who are, you know, maybe a little bit smaller, maybe a little bit of a project, but, you know, who knows? You bring them over to San Diego, you give them, you know, one or two years, and now maybe you got a third liner. That's great. Like, I, I would have no problem with him turning into it. I think it's worth a shot. Yeah, I'm just happy that somebody actually picked up the phone in the Ducks front office when European scout Konstantin Krylov actually called in and said, pick this guy. And they actually went, this is the first pick that they've actually listened to him for a very long time. So he's finally getting his money's worth. I mean, I, he's been with the organization, I think, for 10 or 15 years. And, and you know, they're like I said, they're European scout in Russia. Uh, and this guy has to make how many kind of pitches each year to take this guy or take that guy and they, they don't end up taking a Russian and he finally gets uh, gets the call on a guy who's a quadruple overager <laughs> which is uh, an interesting one for them to get maybe you know in the, in the future it means he'll draft more Russians I doubt it because Alexander Passion was on the board forever uh, and of course the Carolina Hurricanes got him because every year the, the, the Hurricanes seem to draft better than everybody else I don't know what it is, but their their scouting department is is clearly miles above everybody else. Uh, last two guys, we'll we'll go through these guys very quick because there's almost at this point in the draft, there's almost no scouting reports on some of these guys. Uh, at 160th overall, they took Alvin Sundsvik, who is a Swedish overage center playing in the SHL. A nice pick, you know. He, if he makes it to the NHL, it, it would be you know probably as a third or fourth line center at most. He's just a, a reliable two-way center, like you know, the typical Swedish player in terms of being very good in his own end. He's good at the face-off dot. He can chip in offensively every now and then. But, you know, long-term projections are he probably doesn't make the NHL. And like I said, if he does, he's a you know bottom six player. And I think the, the same potentially goes for Ethan Bowen. He, he's a bit more uh, – has a bit more upside. He's a bit more of a project. He's a big, lanky kid playing in the uh, BCHL, which is you know not a, a league you traditionally see top prospects come out of. So there is some potential for upside once he does go to college that if he can kind of up his game that he could be a, a pretty good player. But you know, how many seventh-round picks do you, do you see make the NHL and, and have a significant <laughs> impact? I mean, if anybody's going to do it, it's probably going to be Anaheim when we look at their history and, and how well they've done in the sixth and seventh rounds. But... You know, I, I think at this point, I mean, they they traded a pick. They traded for this pick. Uh, you know, I, whether it was to take him or somebody else that went before it, they, they wanted to get into the seventh round to take somebody. And if it's Ethan Bowen, then, you know, I trust that they might see something that others don't. So the Ducks finished overall, according to Corey Promet, with a B-plus overall grade. I think it would be nice if we all kind of chimed in with our own. Um, I'll go first then on that. I, I think I'd give him a B. Solid B. I liked it. I didn't love it. It just wasn't my cup of tea. I wanted to see a damn score come down. Nothing forward. against Drysdale. The moment they took Drysdale, it, it was a B for you, no matter what. It was yeah, instantly. <laughs> it went from an A to a B to me. Um, I think, I think I'm right on that B plus A minus range. I think, I think Jamie Drysdale is a great player, or has the potential to be a great player and have Absolutely. a lot. Absolutely. I think it's a weird thing, right? Because he can come in and fix, theoretically, he can come in and, and really help fix a power play that's been broken for, you know, five or six years now. He can come in and be a dynamic producer from the back end. And they don't have that. They also don't have guys who can score 40 goals. And it's a weird, you know, kind of best player available, drafting for need kind of a thing where they kind of need both guys. And now you have to wonder if both guys, like, which one is the best player available, and they felt confident with this, you know, I think then, for me, the, the the reason I would be a little high on this is because on the second and third picks, they took goal scorers. And I think, for me, that shows that they had a plan, that they wanted to get an offensive defenseman early or an, an, an impact defenseman early, and they were going to get goal scorers on the back end. You know, maybe if, you know, Hendricks LaPierre falls or something like that, it's a little different because we're looking at someone maybe who can be a little bit more uh, dynamic and impactful from the center position. But, I, you know, they got a goal-scoring winger with 30-goal upside. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to poo-poo that. I think that's worth something. 
And then Sam Colangelo's a big kid with a decent shot. Like, I think, again, that's something to be grateful for. So I think I'm a little higher on it than that. You know, beyond that, the back end of the draft, it's, it's a bunch of, you know, Throw coin dice. flips. Yeah. I'm just but, angry. I'm an angry Ducks fan, Steve. That's all my problem is. Oh, dude, that's the way, that's Everybody way to Everybody is right now. <laughs> uh, if I could split this draft in half and take the first four picks and, and the the last four picks. The first four picks, I'd probably give it an A-, minus and, and I'd be, you know, verging on giving it a, an A if they took some of the better players on the board where they took Ian Moore. Uh, I think Drysdale, as much as I wanted Alexander Holtz, I think Drysdale clearly fills, fills an organizational need, and if he hits his absolute ceiling as a top-two defenseman, it's a win. You know, there, there's concerns if he's going to be able to hit that. You know, the, is the offense going to translate? Is he going to be a 50, 60 point defense in the NHL? Not many guys can do that. So we'll have to see. But there is the upside there that he could. So I like that pick. And then obviously, you know, I had Jacob Perot in my top 15. So getting him at 27, I think uh, it is exceptional for the Ducks to get that player there. He was clearly, in a lot of people's minds, the best player on the board at that point. So I was surprised to see him fall as far as he did. And, you know, as as much as, like I said before, I think there are better players at the board than Sam Colangelo at 36. There weren't that many better players, you know, maybe two or three who I thought were ranked higher or had some higher potential upside. But I think Colangelo fills an organizational need. And, and like I said before, he's one of those players that you just love to have on your team. Big guy, can score, can kind of do everything, and, and he pairs nicely uh, with a player like Max Jones in the organization. And then Ian Moore, you know, he, he's a project, uh, but if things go well, he's a nice complimentary piece to play uh, on your back end in the future. Um, you know, it's hard to rank, like you said, Stephen, the, the bottom half of the draft, the bottom four picks. Like, there's really no way to grade it because it's, it's flipping coins or throwing darts at that point. I personally give it probably a B minus just because there were players I personally liked better at, at a lot of those picks. So overall, I'd give the Ducks a B plus, but. Uh, I think they had a solid draft. Like, I think they did really well, especially with the first three picks they had. Hey, Eddie, so if they take Poirier instead of Moore, how do you feel about this draft? i probably give it an A-minus at that point because Ian Moore is a project. Yeah. Well, Ian Moore is a project, but so is so is Jeremy Poirier, right? Like, Jeremy Poirier is a, is a project. <laughs> He's an immense project in his own end. He's probably the best offensive defenseman in the draft. That's including Jamie Drysdale. Right. But he cannot play defense at all. Like, yeah. He, there's maybe times he can, but he's just not interested in it. Like he, there are times he just switches off and, and does not care, which I, I don't think I've ever seen a defenseman like him, which is why I think you take a swing at him as a third-round pick, right? Like a guy like Antonio Stranges – who is uh, a forward from the London Knights, fell to, I think, the fourth or fifth round to the Dallas Stars. I'm sure they love it. You know, he's a guy that can, you know, probably has the, the best hands in the draft, has a unique skating style, but he can't play defense, and the points weren't there for him. But those are the guys you take swings on in the, in the fourth round or the fifth round or the sixth round because you, know, you might as well try and swing big, and if it busts, it busts. But, uh, yeah, I, I think if they had got Poirier – at uh, at whatever sixty nine or whatever they sixty seven where where more was picked, I, I would have probably given this uh, you know bumped it up to an A minus. So, yeah, go oh, ahead. Steve. I was gonna say I just think it's interesting, you know, because it. I think it's a little bit more exaggerated with Poirier, but I think he is kind of a offensive defenseman version of Perot, where, you know, I think there are questions about the quality of the team that he was on in juniors, and I think you're looking at someone with an incredible amount of skill who seems to just kind of phase in and out as far as what's going on in his own end and things like that. But, you know, I think you got a guy like Marty Wilford on the bench who's shown that he can do a good job of working with defensemen. I, I, I think the fact that Ian Moore is a similar, if lesser type of player is encouraging, but I do think for, I'm, I'm with Eddie as far as Poirier would have been a big swing that could pay huge dividends. Well, so. and and you look at you know the Kings ended up getting Martin Kromiak one pick before the Ducks did, and Kromiak was a guy some people had almost creeping into the first round. I think he fell to the fifth round, and I felt like the Ducks were gonna take him at at the spot where um, I think it was where they got Gallimov. 
know, maybe they weren't. Maybe Galimov was their guy all along. But it just it always just feels like these guys fall right to the Kings. I remember last year it was Akil Thomas that was falling and falling and falling, and it was coming up to the Ducks pick, the Kings pick before them, and of course the Kings take him and. It's painful every year to see the Kings do so well in the draft. I, I think uh, Mark Yannetti, their their director of scouting, came out after the draft and he was like, "We're ecstatic with where we came out of this draft with the guys that they got where they got them." And um, you know, yeah, there, there like I said, there were guys later on in the draft. I think the Ducks could have taken, but that's my personal preference. I mean, these guys are scouts in the NHL. I'm sure there's a reason they took Ian Moore where they did, the Galimov where they did, right? So, yeah. So moving on now, guys, the Ducks qualifying offers, Sherwood, DeLeo, Dostal, Sideroff, and uh, Parison were all due qualifying offers. Did anybody sign? I think it was DeLeo. No? Yeah. That was the only one? DeLeo signed That's the only we know of. for 700 k in the NHL, two-way contract, 140 k in the AHL, which is likely where he'll play. It's a one-year deal, so he'll likely be in San Diego. If, if he plays any games at the, in the NHL, it'll be due to injury probably kind of surprised about Sherwood to be honest with you I don't know if he's like I, I don't know what's happening with him yet like the Ducks notoriously as always have not put out any news I think every other team whether it's their their beat writers or the team themselves has come out and said you know we're qual we've qualified these guys we haven't qualified these guys these guys are going to UFA and I know Eric Stevens put an article earlier today that had referenced that Sherwood and DeLeo both received contracts, but so far we've only heard about DeLeo. I'd be surprised if they didn't at least qualify Kiefer Sherwood and give him a similar contract to DeLeo. I know he's not yep. an exceptional player, but he's the best of those players in terms of potentially jumping into a fourth-line role. I think he's a perfect energy fourth-line forward. Well, oh, you got to um, keep San Diego fresh, too. You can't just yeah. not worry about your, your minor league team. So I, I'd be surprised if, if we, you know, whenever the news finally comes out, probably tomorrow morning, uh, if we find out that Kiefer Sherwood didn't get a qualifying offer. The other guys in, uh, who was it, uh, Person, um, Person, Dosti, and Sidorov, I, I would assume they probably didn't. Um, they weren't really key contributors. Sidorov and Dosti played in, in the uh, ECHL for most of their time over the last couple of years, and Pearson was brought over from, from Edmonton for, I think, like a seventh-round pick or something. So I don't expect those guys uh, to get qualifying, but I would I would be surprised if Sherwood didn't. So what's up with David Backus, boys? Why is he uh, being told he's going to be able to play this next season here in Anaheim? Why on God's green earth are we playing David Backus in our lineup? I have... No clue, so I wanted to ask you guys. Cause it was very typical, but but frustrating to read that tweet. So, I, you know, for me, I think <laughs> I just don't get it. You know, I think uh, I, you know I saw it and I was a little frustrated because I think there is an opportunity there to buy him out. I don't think it would have been uh, really owners on the cap. I don't think um, there's a lot of things to be gained from buying him out. Not the least of which is a roster spot. But, I mean, it's, what, three or four years now where we've continuously heard Bob Murray at the end of the year just talk about how pissed, he, pissed off he is at that middle group age-wise of leadership. You know, David Backus has played in the Olympics. He's played uh, he's played big games in the playoffs. You know what I mean? Like, he was a huge part. He was the captain of those St. Louis Blues teams for, you know, a decade. Like, I, I can appreciate the off-the-ice locker room types of things that he is going to bring to the organization, working with some of the younger guys, teaching them how to be a professional. You know, I don't think David Backus fell off because he stopped caring. I think his body gave out on him because he's yep. a power. So I think there's value in that. And, you know, not to jump ahead a little bit, but I think the fact that they moved on from Good Branson is actually very encouraging for me because, you know, Good Branson's one of those guys where he's an old school physical, oh, you touch the kid, I'm going to go punch you in the face kind of guy. I love those guys. But you can't have him and Bacchus and Delorier. And, you know, uh, you only get six guys on the ice as far as defensemen. It's a little bit easier to take a guy like Bacchus, drop him on your fourth line, and uh, see what he can do and, you know, keep him in the fold. So uh, I think you can make a lot of reasonable and sound arguments for why it's a bit of a wasted opportunity. Uh, but I can see how having him around could benefit some of the younger guys. Well, he's 50 games away from hitting a thousand. So that might also be a reason why they kept him. 
And he's got a modified no trade clause, so he has to submit a list. Well, so. yeah, and the only option they had apparently was they were going to buy him out, and, and at this point, with one year left on his deal, what's what's the point in buying yeah. out that contract and, and having it? I mean, they already got Perry making six point six two five for not even being here for for this upcoming year. So, you know, I, I think the fact they were able to move on from Gabranson was was excellent and, and get out from under that salary. It's it's opened up some cap space for tomorrow. And we have to remember too, yes, right now they have four point four million dollars in cap space. Uh but, you know, if they spend to the limit, uh, you know, let's say they they sign, you know, we'll get into this more. Let's say they just sign a right handed defenseman for five million dollars. What it doesn't matter really matter what the term is tomorrow. They go over the cap, but then Ryan Kessler's contract can be put on LTIR at that point, and you've got yeah. this you know whatever you need up until six point eight seven five million in relief space there. So they technically, if they spend it all, have almost eleven million dollars in cap space if they want to use it. Now you kind of play with fire, you know, going over the LTIR limit at that point, but. They've they've added some flexibility and buying up David Backus, you know, after that uh, Erica Branson trade really doesn't make a lot of sense. And with Derek Grant officially gone, you do need a fourth line center. I know it's an expensive fourth line center, but it, it's just for next year, and you clear that entire amount off the cap without having to worry about paying him whatever you know for a buyout over you know the years when he's not even playing here. It was nice to see them get rid of Erica Branson, like you said. We should move on to that. That clears the Ducks four million in cap space. Um, so now they're looking at uh, everyone's thinking Shattenkirk and Tyson Berry, which is according to was it uh, Pierre LeBrun's article. He said they were keeping tabs on them. And speaking of small defense, but I think Tyson Berry's five ten. So is he really? yeah, he's a yeah. small guy, not a big guy at all. But he's he's had a knack for the net, right? I mean in. Uh, uh, he was putting up points in Colorado. He had a couple 50-point seasons. He kind of had a somewhat of a down year in Toronto. But uh, that's just the way it goes when you go to Toronto. He got he got shit on a lot in, well, in that's Toronto. That's the Toronto media, right? Like It's just not good. He would have had to have a 50-point season. Arms here. Yeah, he would have had to have a 50-point <laughs> season in Toronto for it to be a success. He still had 39 points in 70 games, right? Like, that's not that bad of a year. Like, mm-hmm. it really isn't that bad. But it's – they sent Kadri for him and it was a you know a big payment for them to get rid of Kadri and ironically enough Kadri is probably the type of player they needed in the playoffs when you know you look at the fact they need kind of that gritty player uh oh, to add Kadri some... played great in Colorado right exactly <laughs> he was a big he was a big piece for for that team and and you know it's just disappointing I think you know Tyson Berry was always going to go up against it with Kadri playing well in Colorado and Barry not I guess living up to the hype in in Toronto but Man, like if the Ducks can take advantage of a down year, you know, statistically for him in comparison to the fact that, you know, his last two seasons in Colorado, he almost got to 60 points both years. And if he had to play the full season, he probably would have got to 60 points in both those years. That's like upper echelon top 10 defenseman production right there. And if you can get him for less than what his last deal was, which is just over $5 million, lock him down for maybe two or three years. That's a great deal for the Ducks. He's like he, he's exactly what they need right now if they want to be competitive, which it seems like they do. And there's, we're not getting away from that anymore. We've talked about a rebuild how often, but clearly we're not going down that route. So if we're in a retool and they're looking to be competitive next year, who's the best guy to add in free agency? It's Tyson Berry, in my opinion. You know, there are you know, Kevin Shattenkirk, of course. They're going to explore that route. He wanted to come here at one point. I'm assuming that his number one option is to go back to Tampa Bay and try and win another cup. You know, people have mentioned Tony D'Angelo, uh, who's an RFA out of the Rangers. The Ducks would have to trade for his rights. He's another player who, as much as I don't like the guy as a person, he is a, a pretty good hockey player and uh, you know is an offensive defenseman as well. But you know, any one of those three guys is is great. But Tyson Berry, you, you know, they move some cap space for a reason, and I'm sure that he's probably near the top of their list. I would definitely want to take him. I would love to get Tyson Berry. I think, you know, on a number of levels. One, like you said, his price point's probably going to be real low because he had a bad year in Toronto. And then I just think, you know, I'm, you know, I don't want to get all 200 hockey men, but I'm kind of a big, you know, mental and emotional guy. And I just think walking out of the pressure cooker of Toronto where your coach is fired, you know, a month and a half or whatever into the season – you know, now you 
I just think that whole situation was was bad news. And I think if you can bring in Tyson Berry, give him a little bit of security, you know, to I think you said it earlier, Eddie, you know, like two years, four and a half million total. You know, you bring him in and you're like, hey, man, we just want you to play on a middle pair. You know, you can put him and Cam Fowler together. So now you've got a bit of a traditional shutdown pair and a little bit more of an aggressive offensive pair. You know, he's going to come into Anaheim. There's not going to be pressure. There's not going to be media. He's going to get to see the sun. You know what I mean? Like, I just think (laughs) reasons to think that he could really have a great bounce back year. And if you can, you know, kind of catch him on the cheap, like, you know, I feel bad, you know, for these guys. And I feel bad in that way that you're like kind of taking advantage of these guys. But it's a hard cap league. You know, you, you've got to find your value where you can. And I think, you know, like you guys said, I think he's exactly the type of player that they should really be looking for, especially since age-wise, he's kind of right in where they need to be. He's like 28, 29? He's 29, yeah. Yeah, he's right in that kind of bridge area, you know. He's not 32 and he's not 25. So you're not really going to be trying to lock him down for six years. You can probably get him on three three years and hope he does well. You know, and if it doesn't work, you can maybe trade him somewhere else or whatever. You're not paying him a ton of money. I think Tyson Berry is probably at this point a great option. One, the best. one thing I want to point out about Tyson Berry's usage in Toronto as well is you look at his two most successful seasons in Colorado were the last two. Uh, and he was deployed heavily in the offensive zone, which he should be for the type of defenseman he is. Over 62%. Uh, of his zone starts were offensive zone starts for both of those years. He goes to Toronto, goes down to about 58%. He's given more defensive responsibility, and he's also not the number one go-to option on the power play or at five on five. It was Morgan Riley, and you know at times he just you know they were playing five fours almost on the power play for, for Toronto. Like it just really was not a good fit for him. And I think if you know if you bring him to Anaheim, like you said, out of that environment, out of the media. You play him with a defensively responsible partner like Hampus Lindholm, where you give that freedom for Barry to be creative and and you know do what do what makes him the player he is or he the player he was in Colorado. You give him the power play to run for the time being, which is where he made his money in Colorado as well. I think this you know this is one of the perfect environments for him. And of course, we're biased being Ducks fans, but you just look at the setup. And, and what he could walk into here, being the go-to offensive defenseman paired with a perfect partner, in my opinion, in Hampus Lindholm, and being told, man, like, the power play's yours. And, like, I, I, I think for him, other than the Ducks maybe not being as competitive a team as he would like, I think this is the perfect kind of bounce-back contract for him. And, and you, know, I'm, you know, as a player, I'm sure, and especially after a down year and, and being in the media and, and having that perception, you know, you you want to look for a four or five, you know, year deal to kind of take you to the end of, of your career in the NHL. Um, but if you're Tyson Berry at 29, you know, you take a two year deal now, you can get a pretty big payday at 31 or 32 and get that long term contract down the road if you put up the numbers. And I think he has the perfect opportunity to do that in Anaheim if that was to be the case. Yeah, and you guys make a great point. You got, I mean, you guys, I mean, Eddie, you know that I I hate the leadership qualities in sports a lot of the time i think it's overplayed big time but it does play somewhat of a role and liking where you work is another one if you hate your job and you hate going to work every day with your coworkers and you hate your boss uh you're really not going to have a good time or a good showing or a good performance most of the time so uh, that being said if you were to come here and be a leader and be in a position to be successful it makes a huge difference for your attitude every single day so as much as i downplay that i think going from toronto which is just a nightmare uh, it, it, or I mean, or I think the only place worse than Toronto would be Montreal. Uh, either one of those, oh, and then you come here it would just yeah. would just be a cakewalk to come here in California. So that's my th- he should just he should just sign now because we just said all the great things. So I'm sure he's yeah. listening. Thanks, Tyson. We appreciate you. We love you. <laughs> but you know, you know, it's crazy. We're talking about this, and, and it's in October, and free agency is tomorrow. That's oh yeah, that's the, the crazy thing. There's not a lot of time to prepare and. You know, March two hundred and seventy-five. Yeah, and, and uh, obviously that's why we see um, the good Branson trade today. So I mean, good signs that at least, you know, as much as I'd like the Ducks to just go for as high draft picks as they can over the next couple of years, you know, that's not the case for Bob Murray. They got the high draft pick this year, and and at least they're hopefully trying to make moves. Now we're being optimistic. We could get into tomorrow, and the Ducks could sign nobody or. You know, not even be interested to get outbid for Tyson Berry, Shot, and Kirk D'Angelo, and 
sign Cody Cece or, or something like that, right? Like that's usually how it goes. But the you know the signs of trading Good Branson, the small comment we got from Murray today saying that you know he's looking for some cap flexibility. Looks like they want to go spend that money. They didn't retain any of Good Branson's salary, so hopefully that means when we get into tomorrow. Uh, you know, we see one of those names we talked about come, and hopefully it's Tyson Berry. Yeah, I think I, I made this point on Twitter earlier. I think for me, you know, and, and you can you can catch yourself, you know, reading a little too much into stuff like this, but I think just the pure optics of taking your very traditional large stay-at-home defenseman like at Branson and saying we're sending him out the door, and that's that. And then the name that you hear is a five foot ten offensive minded defenseman. Like for me, that is such an indication that the franchise is at least, you know, thinking a little bit more modern as far as how to address roster creation, you know, because you've already got Josh Manson. If you're looking for a big body physical player to, you know, push people away in front of the net, you got him. So I don't know that you need to then bring in a guy like or hold on to a guy like at Branson. Um, you know, and so going out and getting another thing. And I think, Eddie, you made the point as far as pairing him with Lindholm. Uh, I think that's really interesting. You know, I don't think that historically Fowler and Manson have been great, but you can see the way in which that would be successful. And if you can get two pairs that have a little bit of balance to them, I think that could be a big, uh, a big boon for Anaheim as far as, you know, moving the puck and creating offense and, really trying to play a more modern style of hockey. Yeah, and one thing I want to address before we get to the fan questions here is is there was some speculation that with the Eric Branson being moved that was pa- potentially paving the way for Jamie Drysdale to start the season with the Ducks this year. No, I don't want to say He's that's, 17. Right. <laughs> I don't want to say it's out of the question because there there is a lot of issues going a lot going on with the OHL right now in terms of there potentially might not have any contact whatsoever that includes fighting or body checking uh that would be great for a player like jamie drysdale he would tear the league apart but (laughs) don't get into it right now don't get into it right now we'll get into this that's a that's a 30 minute segment for ed yes so So. it's it's going to be we're going to dive into it more on sunday on pucks and brews but um in terms of how it relates to jamie drysdale you know, because of the agreement with the NHL and the CHL, he can't play in the AHL with San Diego. So he can either only play in, you know, Erie or play with the Ducks. Or because, you know, players have been loaned this year, we've seen some CHL players go over to Europe. He could go over to Europe. I don't think he will. I don't think he's one of those players that will decide to go over to Europe. So I think he'll just wait it out and, and play with Erie. But for me personally, I don't think it's right for his development to hop right into the NHL. The Ducks did that with Cam Fowler. It, it didn't work out. He had a great rookie season. Bobby said that was but... his uh, biggest regret. Well, yeah, then he got yeah, then he got smoked by uh, Shane Doan, yeah. and that kind of put a damper on his first year. That wasn't yeah. good. The, the NHL has changed, and Jamie Drysdale skates at an NHL level. I just don't think the rest of his game is, is ready to jump right into the NHL. As exceptional of a talent he is, I think – you know, one more year to really, really dominate in the OHL, I think is important for him. And then, and at the very earliest, I think then we see him the season after that. Yeah, I just think confidence, maturity wise, I think there is a lot of reasons to think that there are legitimate positives to not rushing him into a situation. You guys can hear that. I can tell. Your <laughs> dog, dog's going crazy. <laughs> no big deal. Uh, but yeah, I just think, you know, the Ducks aren't in a position where they need to uh, rush into a situation like that. And I think that's why I like Barry makes so much sense. It's kind of a stopgap. He provides a similar type of skill set, and he's not someone that you're going to need to like an Alex Petrangelo, for example, where you're you know going to need to commit, you know, eight million dollars for seven years or whatever. Like, it's not like that. It's a perfectly good way to address the need now and still keep yourself flexible moving forward. You want to hop into some fan questions, boys? We got plenty on yeah, Twitter we for got, this. We got from this show and last show because we didn't have any time to get to questions oh, last boy. show, and we're almost verging on that this show. But we need to get to them because all the, these ones are time-sensitive with free agency being tomorrow. Um, we'll kind of go through them as quick as we can here. We'll get uh, everybody's thoughts on them real quick. But Ricky asked a bunch of questions. Some of them we got to, so I'll just read them them all off here. 
Uh, he asked us for our, our thoughts on the Ducks draft selections, which we got to. Uh, what free agents do we see the Ducks in the running for, which we kind of talked about Shattenkirk and Barry, uh, among others. Uh, but the one question I want to get answers from you guys are is, who would you like to see the Ducks' backup be if we don't re-sign Miller or Kevin Boyle? He gives some uh, some guys here in, in Eric Snack mm. and Stolars, but who who's your backup for the Ducks this year? You can go free agency if you want if uh, Miller doesn't come back. Henry Lundquist. <laughs> I was going to say Braden Holtby. You stole my joke. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I don't know. I think you try to look for another guy kind of like, you know, Ryan Miller. I don't know that I'm super comfortable with a guy like Stellars just because if you have some expectation of being competitive, I don't know that you want to drop that on him like that. I'd rather bring in a veteran guy who is a little bit, I, you know, I mean – I don't know if he's in that situation, but I wouldn't necessarily say no to like, like a Cam Talbot or something. I don't think that would be terrible if he's too willing to take the kind of money that, you know, Anaheim right now is in a position to give to a backup. You know, I don't think that would be the worst thing in the world at all. Um, you know, Anton that, Kadobin's a good choice too. Yeah, but he's gonna make like four million. Yeah, right? some, he's gonna go somewhere where he could potentially steal a starting job. I think like he's, he's, he's going New will. Jersey well, or Carolina or something. As long as we don't take Mike Smith. Yeah, good. That's the one. Good with that. Yeah. I, I, you know, I'm honestly interested to, if the Ducks have gotten an answer from internally from Ryan Miller yet, because I would think going into free agency they would want to know what's happening. Is he coming back? Is he not? I mean, he's a UFA tomorrow. Right, like he is a he's an unrestricted free agent. I think you know Anaheim is probably his only destination he's going to go, and and they'll want to bring him back if they can. But you no, know, he's likely going to get calls unless his agents put it out there that he's not going anywhere but Anaheim. So uh, you know, I would I would expect they would have already gotten an answer from him, or at least close to a concrete answer if he's coming back or not. And you know, I think it'll be pretty telling if they go out and sign a backup goaltender tomorrow, or an AHL level goaltender. Um, you know, if he's going to actually come back or not, or they just re-sign him tomorrow. Well, you know, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. I'm, I'm sure one of those kind of comes about at some point. Yeah, I think you know, the one good thing is there's going to be 75 goaltenders who are going to be more than competent of playing 20 games next season. Mm-hmm. I, I think they're in a position where they can definitely give him the amount of time that he needs to come to a decision about how he feels. And know that when the music stops, there's going to be more goalies than chairs, and they're going to be able to get somebody. You know, I mean, are we a hundred percent sure Mark Andre Fleury doesn't get bought out and they don't sign him to a one-year, a million-dollar contract? Like, I, you know, I don't know that. You know, we talked about his health earlier, but I don't know that Corey Schneider doesn't come in and play 15, 20 games and just, you know, just provides that guy who can just sit there. You know what I mean? I, I think there is going to be more than enough opportunities to find somebody who is capable of being a good backup. This is not going to be a 1A, 1B situation. This is going to be John Gibson's our guy. We're hoping he plays 60 games. And, you know, we're going to need you to come in when the Ducks let him down and, you know, back-to-backs. I don't know about that because the the Ducks are really worried about their health, right? They brought in that guy, I forget his name, it's going to lose me here. To He's like the the nutrition expert. He came over and looked oh. to look over... Well, I forget his name. It's trying to drive me nuts. Beetle? We talked about Beetle? it. Something Beetle. Like You're right. Yeah, yeah, it was Beetle. He came over to help up with that. And one of the biggest concerns is fatigue on this team. And and Gibby's been overused a lot in recent years. So I, I would project they were probably looking to maybe play him 50 games. I don't think they're looking at a 60-game season for him. And that's a lot. That's a big workload for, for Gibson. Uh, especially with the defense in front of him. That's well, it, <laughs> He faces it, it, it an unreal be amount of shots and chances. Yeah, yeah. I, you, you would, would hope, hope the workload's less. But the structure is better, the, the defense in front of him. But, like, honestly, like, I know Gibson was fatigued, but if the Ducks are going to be competitive again. He needs to play 60 games, if not more. Like, he has to. That's just the reality it's of the NHL. Not, here's a Marty Brodeur, dude. The, the goalies just, that they don't do that. But anymore. unless you have... A, like, look at what, how many games Vasilevsky played last year because the Lightning didn't have a capable backup goaltender. Like, if you need... Okay, so you're that's gonna, cool. You picked pick well. the best goaltender in the league behind one of the best teams in the league. Like, of course yeah, he can play that many yeah, games. Yeah, well, Connor Hellebuck, they didn't have anybody behind him. And he won a Vesna trophy. Yeah, because he had to play. He had to play. <laughs> he, he did. He, he, played, he played 58 games last year. So yeah, I, that's I think okay. Some 60 is fine with him. Yeah. yeah, if you're Gibson, you got to play 55 to 60 bare minimum for me if the Ducks want to be a good team. 
okay, so I'll say this. I, I think both of you are right, and I don't, you know, I don't want to be Mr. Both Sides, but I do think that if they want to legitimately have a chance at making the playoffs, I do think you're in a position where you've got to see Gibby playing 55, 60 games. If you're fine with hoping that the team and the system improves enough in front of him that you don't have to rely on him to be a heart candidate level goalie, then I think it's fine saying he plays 50 games and you find somebody who can come in and play 25, 30 games. Um, I just don't think if, especially if that's where you're at, you can't have Stolarz come up and you have to go sign somebody. You, you, we're, we're talking about this and there might not even be an 82 game season this year. We have no idea. Yeah, there's like, not going to be. It's going to be short. Yeah. It, it, it's gonna it's short. likely going to be around 60 or 62 and he'll probably play 40 games in that season. So, or he could play all of them. We, like you don't have to worry about it too much. The fatigue might not be an issue this year. Um, kind of along those lines. Adam Kunos asked us, uh, do you think the unusual offseason will have an effect on this team in terms of, you know, a slow start or, or something like that? They're notoriously slow starting at the gate. It seems like every year it doesn't really matter what it is before Steven goes and kills his dog. Uh, notoriously are slow starters out of the gate. We've seen it time and time again with this team. Um, so I don't think it really matters necessarily with how long this is. I think this just gives them every benefit to be healthy. And that, to me, is probably the most important aspect for this offseason to get the guys ready to go for the season uh, and no injuries. Like, we had guys facing injuries into last year. We can't have that. No surgeries. Everyone's healthy. Let's get the season on a roll. The Ducks have the hardest time staying healthy in the league, as we all know, being fans. Um, how tough that is every year to watch man games lost just pile up. So I think it's going to be a good thing for them. Yeah, I mean, I think as far as health, you're looking at a couple of guys, not the least of which is Getze, and you hope that that helps him. You know, I'm not sure that on a team where you really are going to be hoping that the younger guys take a leap, that it's going to have much of an impact. You know, maybe they can get a little bit of time in the gym or, you know, maybe uh, the GMs of the seven bad teams get their wish and we get that prolonged, uh, you know, training camp kind of thing and they can get a little bit more comfortable, maybe get a head start on some of these other teams. But other than that, I'm not really sure there's much upside beyond, you know, maybe Getsy turns the clock back a year. But, you know, I, I'm not – I don't think there's a huge thing there. Yeah, I, I think every team's going through it, right? So it, it – and I know seven teams have been off a lot longer than the rest of them, but – um, I, I'm not too worried about it considering, you know, like I said, every team kind of has to go through it. Um, we'll try and kind of whip through the, these next ones uh, with just kind of some quick answers here. John asked us, do you think the Ducks make any actual big trades this offseason? He was talking about Vegas is maybe trying to relieve some cap with marches. So I don't think the Ducks, I don't think that's their play. It'd be wonderful to have them, but I don't think the Ducks are pushing – any big trade. I think if you see anybody come in here, it's going to be a defenseman, and that's about it. I don't think that they're going to be making any sort of moves. I, I hope that they finally realize this year they're not going to be ultra competitive. Uh, I think us as fans have finally learned that too, that we don't have high expectations for this next season. Just don't want to be dead in the water and horrible to watch. Just to be fun and lose, I'm okay with that. So, yeah, I don't see them making any push for a big name. Yeah, I don't think if they make a trade, it's going to be a big name. I think, you know, depending on how the first – third to half of the season goes maybe at the deadline you know we have a moment where we look ourselves in the mirror and you know Raquel or maybe Manson or uh, Henrik and Silverberg maybe one of them gets moved out but I, I doubt it uh, I think you know good Branson moving out is almost a guarantee that Manson's going to be on this team at least through the end of this contract so you know I I don't think you're going to get a big trade I think maybe you can get a couple of smaller trades that can maybe pay off. But I think any of the trades that are going to be a big deal are going to be the ones from last year. You know, maybe Danton Heinen takes a leap. Maybe Milano takes a leap. But I, I think that's about it, you know, as far as what the Ducks are going to be looking at for trades. We'll uh, move to a question from Joshua Northcott. He said, if we see a breakout year from one of the young forwards, come to us, steal Terry, Milano, et cetera, who do you think it will be? Pat, who do you think uh... – who do you think of the young guys? You know, Terry and Jones uh, included in there as well. Or even, I guess, I, you guys. I really like Maxime Comtois a lot. Um, but I would honestly, if you say Jones, I hope I hope, I hope, hope Max Jones has a great year. He's a good guy. We've had him on the show a couple of times. Um, we've gotten in trouble because of him. That's why I like him even more. So, uh, 
yeah, I hope I hope Max Jones has a really good year for the Ducks this year, has a breakout season. I really do. I really do. Yeah, I uh, I honestly, if we're taking a little bit of a long shot, I'd, I'd love to see Isaac Lundstrom whenever the season picks back up, stick in the stick in the league for you know fifty games, sixty games, the back half of the season, whatever it is. I'd love to see him stick around. I think he's got the potential to be a very helpful and useful bottom of the lineup player. That'd be a lot of fun. And then, you know, I'm a big Max Jones guy. So if he can, if he can really make it happen, I think he'd be great. I think, you know, he's just got to score on half those chances. He gets, he gets the chances, right? He gets the chances. He's got a good chance. You know, I, I, I mean, he could in any year, it seems like go for 20 goals and 10 assists or 10 goals and 20 assists. I think he's, you know, he's a good playmaker. He's a good skater. He's really, uh, you know, seemed to grow as far as consistent effort night to night. Um, you hope, probably all things considered, that Steele or Terry hits 40 points next year. Um, I think that would be the most important. Maybe Comtois, you know, comes in and he scores 20 goals, you know, whatever. But I think uh, I think those three are the guys of your management you're hoping are come through because those are probably your highest upside guys. But, you know, for me, I'm looking at Lunderstrom and Jones as the guys that I would really like to see become a presence on the team in one form or another. Yeah, the the two for me are I, I want to see Jones uh, offensively take a step forward. I think he's done kind of everything else solid so far, but he needs to show that he can finish at the NHL level. Uh, if he can, I think, again, like we talked about earlier with a line of like Colangelo, Steele, and Jones in the future is a, a very good third line for the Ducks to be able to roll out. But a lot of that hinges on, like, I think Sam Steele is, is on his way to being a capable third or, or second line center. I think he was the best of the young players the Ducks had last year. Uh, but Max Jones has, has some improvement to do on the offensive side of the game. And then Maxim Comtois, I just want to see more of him at the NHL level because he's the one we've kind of seen the least of at this point. But both of those guys have a, a tough track to get to the NHL level right now with guys like Heinen and Raquel and Sonny Milano still kind of all there. And, I, and you know, I would guess holding at least some sort of seniority over them in terms of their age and their NHL experience at this point. So I think it's going to be tough for everybody to get in next year. I don't see the Ducks adding too many free agents to block them anymore t- tomorrow, at least up front. So, you know, those are the two guys I'm looking for. Uh, we'll move into the last two questions here. Just a quick one-word answer for this one. Sorry? Okay. No, no, no. I just don't worry about it. (laughs) All right. Quick one-word answer for this question. If you had a choice between these three defensemen tomorrow, you know, consider whatever, you know, obviously some guys' contracts are going to be higher than others. Who would you have? Tori Krug? Yes. Tyson Berry or Kevin Shattenkirk? (laughs) Krug. Group. Oh, yeah. No, I'm saying Barry. I'm going to stick. I, I, I want him to have a comeback, and I think that it's not going to be a seven-year contract. So I'll, I'll say Barry. It's tough to pass up on Tory Krug because he's clearly the best defenseman of the bunch. Uh, but when you take everything into consideration, like you said all things considered, um, like, you know, everything, uh, it's just the player based off the player, I would say Tory Krug. But you know Krug's going to get six or seven million dollars, uh, probably close to six and a half, seven million over se- over six or seven years, right? Like he is a top defenseman in this league. I think he'll get that from somebody out there because he's one of the most high profile names on the market right now. Um, so for that reason, I wouldn't pick him just because of that. I don't think the Ducks really want to lock themselves down into a contract like that. Uh, and if Tyson's Berry's contract is what I think it is. If it was a two or three year deal at around five, four and a half to five, then he'd be my option. But it all depends. It'd be easier to project uh, project what Krug's contract is over over Tyson Berry. But uh, last uh, last question we have here. There was a bunch that we couldn't get to. So if you didn't hear your question called, I'm sorry. Uh, but this question's from Duncan. He said, "Looking at Egan's body of work this season, do you think he's a good fit from the team?" And second kind of part of that question is who loses their job first, him or Murray, if this season is as bad as the last one? <laughs> Neither. Neither one of them are going anywhere. <laughs> Bob Bob Murray's not getting fired. He's not going to get fired. He's at, the, he's at the end of his career. That would be a terrible thing to do to that guy. Um, as much as everyone hates him, we've, we've all had our moments where we haven't liked GMBM. But um, 
you know, he's he's done a lot of good for the franchise, and I just I can't see this being the end. I can't see him getting fired or or Aikens either. He's not going anywhere. Uh, yeah. If it came down to it, I think the I think for me the most realistic option is they uh, Dale Talonin, where they they kick him up a step or whatever, and they bring in somebody to work under him and. Oh. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I think, of hockey operations. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think in a lot of ways, Murray has earned that right, right? I think you're absolutely right. He's done a lot of good things for the franchise. I know we've all been frustrated, especially the last few years, with what we perceive as you know, short-sighted decision-making. But he has he kept the team contending for the better part of a decade. And he may not have done it in the ways that we wanted, but I think he did it in a way that made sense for a smaller market team and things like that so i think if anybody were to lose their job as it were it would be murray but i don't think he's going to get fired and for the first part of the question is dallas akins a good fit for this team and he's is he you know piggybacking onto that is he the guy that is going to take this team back to being a successful team damn that's a tough one yeah, uh, we all know that he wasn't our first vote when we were when we were doing our coaching picks a, co- a couple seasons ago, for sure. But um, I don't know. I, I would have to see where this where this team is. This is a weird season. It's a weird year. You could chalk up a lot if things don't go right. But um, I'm not upset with with uh, with Dallas at all. Uh, I would have to see what the first few months of the season look like before I make any sort of assumption on on whether he's a, a perfect fit for this team. Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, it's kind of unfair, but I do think it's two questions, right? Do I think he's going to be the coach when this team is contending again? Hard to know. Really hard to know. A lot of things have to happen between now and then. A lot of things have to go right. Do I think he's a good coach for right now? Yeah, I do. Because I think he's going to focus on them, uh, the players as people. He's going to work on them being professionals and developing them. And I think given that the, there are a number of guys on this team that, are going to be, you know, it's a little silly in some ways, but they're going to be growing into men as much as they're going to be growing into full-time NHL players. And I think he's going to be great for that. I don't know that he has this job in three years. I don't know that he has this job the next time they play a playoff series. But I think for this season, I am perfectly fine with Dallas Akins uh, being the guy in charge for the whole year. Yeah, I, I agree with that too. I, I think I think it's way too soon to tell if he's the right guy for the job because he got handed an aging team, a team that was going through a transition similar to what he got, not as bad, but similar to the you know what happened to him in Edmonton where he got handled, handed just a not great team and said, okay, you know, this, you do something with this. And he really didn't have anything to work with. And you know, for his time with the Ducks so far, he really hasn't had that much to work with. And, and I, you know, I want to see what, he can do with an actual roster, you know, when, when the younger players start developing a bit more, when, you know, Trevor Zegers jumps into the lineup, when Jamie Drysdale jumps into the lineup and, you know, you know guys like uh, Perot and, and others kind of get in there, Braden Tracy, you know, Benoit Olivier grew. What can he do with, you know, capable players? And if, you know, I think this year will be a telling year to see how he handles some of those transitions. And if the Ducks had a player like Tyson Berry, where, you know, on paper, they look like they're going to be a better team. I think this will be a really telling year for, for Dallas Aikens in terms of, you know, which way the fan base starts to lean. Because I think a lot of people are neutral right now. I don't know many people who are, like, severely in his corner or against him. So I think this is the year where we kind of start seeing fans kind of take sides depending on how the year goes. Can we get to one more question, Ed? Yeah, sure. What, so Jimmy said, uh, should we welcome Jack Johnson Why at the airport with a banner? That one. <laughs> I skipped that one because I didn't want to bring the show down, and you end the show with that one. We gotta show up with cookies, right? That's what. No, are we gonna are we gonna are we gonna be signing Jack Johnson? Does he? You guys think he gets a contract? Probably. Eh? Oh, it, it would it would not it would not surprise me if the Ducks signed him. Uh, Someone's going to sign him. Do I think it might not be till the back end of free agency? Sure, but he's gonna play somewhere next season. He's gonna play five six games. I feel I bad for that guy, though, honestly. Oh, yeah. I can't see him. Terrible what there. happened to him. Yeah, yeah, with his family and everything. I can't see him coming here, though. I really think Bob Murray's pushing for a right handed D. I can't see him bringing oh, another lefty. Maybe. Oh, it'd be so bad. 
<laughs> we get rid of America Branson to bring in Jack Johnson at four million per season and play him oh. on his play him on his offside. There's no <laughs> way. There's so no good. way somebody gives him more than two, right? Like, there's no. I way. love that you just literally trashed one of our top Patreon people I for their question. And you skipped I it. Skipped his question. <laughs> I was thought about asking it, and I skipped it because I don't want to think about. I spent all night before the draft. You saw me tweet it out. I said, the Ducks are going to draft Jake Sanderson, aren't they? And they almost did. So the last thing I want to do is talk about signing Jack Johnson the day before free agency, and then they sign him tomorrow. <laughs> you I've literally already got said bad you didn't trash it, but you're like, <laughs> you had to bring the show down. It's the last question of the night. Yeah. <laughs> just it's all right if that. it's like first question of the night and you can move on and forget about it. Now that we're ending the show with everybody thinking about oh, Jack Johnson God. potentially being an Anaheim Duck. And most yeah. people are listening to this after the fact. So if they're yep. listening to this tomorrow, if you're listening to this after free agency and Jack Johnson is already signed, you can blame Pat because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't bring it up on purpose. So <laughs> Way to bring the show down, Pat. That's great. That's uh, perfect. <laughs> That's a great way to wrap this up. Uh, anything else you guys want to you guys want to input here before we call it a night? Yeah, I'm good. No, Eddie? hopefully Tyson buries a duck tomorrow, and we can move on. Uh, one thing I do want to say is I want to apologize for the technical difficulties on the show today. It was, you know, it was a shit show. It really was. <laughs> we normally uh, record on a different newer platform, which was not allowing us to pull video and audio into the live stream so we had to go back to our older one which also seemed to have technical difficulties because you know among other things i lost audio for about two minutes during the show so <laughs> for the different uh errors you hear during the show we apologize for our next one we will get the problems fixed out we'll be back hopefully on the new platform and everything will be fixed uh, but uh yeah i appreciate everybody coming out hopefully you're listening to this after a nice day tomorrow on friday uh, where the Ducks have, have made some nice moves in free agency. Well, fingers crossed. We say that every year, and it never happens. So we'll be back to talk about it. I'm sure next week we'll we'll do the we'll do a free agency recap probably early next week. So we'll come back with that. Um, and if that's it, then we'll talk to you guys soon. Have a great night, everybody. Bye.